Mars is the Sun's fourth planet. It travels around the Sun at a distance of 228 million kilometers, or around 1.5 times the distance from the Sun. Due to Mars' comparatively elongated orbit, the distance between Mars and the Sun ranges from 206.6 million to 249.2 million kilometers. Mars orbits the Sun once every 687 Earth days, meaning its year is about twice as long as Earth's. At its nearest approach, Mars is less than 56 million kilometers from Earth. But it recedes to about 400 million kilometers, while the two planets are on opposite sides. Mars is easiest to observe when in the sky it and the Sun are in opposite directions i.e., in opposition because it is then high in the sky and reveals a lighted face. Successive opposition occurs every 26 months. Oppositions may occur at various points in Martian orbit. The best for viewing happens when the planet is closest to the Sun, and so also to Earth, as Mars is then at its brightest and highest. Near opposition occurs every 15 years. Mars spins 37 minutes once every 24 hours, making a day on Mars only a little longer than an Earth day. Its axis of rotation is about 25 degrees inclined to its orbital plane, and as with Earth, the tilt produces seasons on Mars. Martian year consists of 668.6 solar days, called sols. Due to the elliptical orbit, southern summers are shorter, 154 Martian days, and warmer than north, 178 Martian days. However, the situation is increasingly shifting, such that 25,000 years from now northern summers will be shorter and colder. Often the axis obliquity or tilt shifts steadily on an approximately 1 million year scale. The obliquity can range from close to zero during the present epochs, when Mars has no seasons, to as high as 45 degrees when seasonal variations are extreme. Over a hundred million years, the obliquity will hit values as high as 80 degrees. Mars is a tiny planet, bigger than Mercury and marginally larger than Earth's size. It has a 3,396 km equatorial radius and 3,379 km mean polar radius. Mars' mass is just one-tenth the terrestrial value, and its gravitational acceleration at the surface of 3.72 meters per second square means objects on Mars weigh a little over a third of their weight on the surface of Earth. Mars has just 28% of Earth's surface area, but since water occupies more than two-thirds of Earth, the two planets' land areas are equivalent. Further orbital and physical data. Mars was an enigma to ancient astronomers, confused by its capricious movement around the sky often in the same direction as the Sun and other celestial objects, direct or software motion, often in the opposite direction, retrograde motion. In 1609, German astronomer Johannes Kepler used his Danish colleague, Tycho Brahe's superior naked eye observations of the Earth to empirically deduce his laws of motion and thus pave the way for modern solar system gravitational theory. Kepler considered Mars orbit an ellipse around which the planet traveled with non-uniform yet predictable motion. Earlier astronomers based their ideas on Ptolemaic's older concept of circular orbit hierarchies and uniform motion. Mars' first telescopic observations of the planet's disk were those of the Italian astronomer Galileo in 1610. Dutch scientist and mathematician Christian Huygens is credited with the first accurate surface marking drawings. In 1659, Huygens made a Mars drawing showing a major dark mark on the planet now called Certus Major. Around 1666, Italian-born French astronomer John Domenico Cassini first noted the Martian polar caps. Visual observers made several key observations. The planet's rotation period was discovered by Huygens in 1659 and estimated by Cassini in 1666 as 24 hours 40 minutes in mistake just three minutes. In the 1780s, the German-born British astronomer William Herschel first noticed the tenuous Martian atmosphere, who also measured the tilt of the planet's rotation axis and first discussed Mars seasons. U.S. Azaf Hall, 1877. Naval Observatory discovered Mars had two satellites. Telescopic observations have recorded many meteorological and seasonal phenomena occurring on Mars, such as different forms of cloud, increasing and diminishing polar caps, and seasonal changes in color and extent of dark areas. 
Wilhelm Beer and Johann Heinrich von Madler of Germany created the first known Mars chart. In 1877, Italian astronomer Giovanni Virginio Schiaparelli prepared Mars' first modern astronomical map, which contained the basis of the nomenclature scheme still in use today. The names on his map are in Latin, primarily in terms of the ancient geography of the Mediterranean region. This map also showed signs of an interconnecting pattern of straight lines on the bright areas that he described as Canali. Schiaparelli is generally credited with their first description, but in 1869 his fellow countryman Pietro Angelo Secchi introduced the concept of Canali. In the late 19th century, American astronomer Percival Lowell founded an observatory specifically to observe Mars in Flagstaff. Arizona and created ever more elaborated maps of Martian canals, until he died in 1916. To the Earth-based telescopic observer. The Martian surface beyond the polar caps is distinguished by bright red ochre-colored patches. Overlapping dark markings. In the past, the bright areas were referred to like deserts. And most of the large dark areas were initially called Maria, assuming they were hidden by water expanses. Earth-based telescopes cannot see topography. Observed are differences in surface brightness or changes in atmospheric opacity. The dark markings cover about one-third of the Martian surface, mostly in a band between latitudes 10 degrees and 40 degrees south around the globe. Their distribution is erratic, and their gross pattern was observed to shift over tens to hundreds of years. Just three main features of the northern hemisphere Acidalia planitia, Certus major, and a dark collar around the pole were once considered shallow seas or vegetated regions. It is now understood that many dark areas of Mars shape and shift as winds drive dark sand around the surface or sweep free of bright dust. Many bright areas are dust accumulation regions. In close-up spacecraft images, canals that featured so prominently on maps, made from telescopic observations around the turn of the 20th century are not visible. They were almost certainly imaginary features that observers felt they saw when straining out objects close to their telescope's resolution limit. Other features such as the darkening wave and the blue haze identified by early telescope observers are now known to result from a combination of viewing conditions and changes in surface reflective properties. The most striking frequent adjustments occur at the poles for telescopic observers. With the onset of dropping in a specific hemisphere, clouds form over the related polar area and the frozen carbon dioxide cap begins to rise. The north's smaller limit eventually stretches to 55 degrees, the south's larger to 50 degrees. The caps recede in spring. During summer, the northern carbon dioxide cap completely melts leaving only a small water ice cap. In the south, during the summer, a tiny residual cap of carbon dioxide ice and water ice lingers. The seasonal polar caps were the topic of controversy for nearly 200 years. An early hypothesis that the caps were made of water ice can be traced back to English, astronomer William Herschel, who imagined that they were like those on Earth. An Irish scientist, George J. Stoney, challenged this hypothesis in 1898 and proposed that the caps might consist of frozen carbon dioxide, but evidence to support the concept was not available until Dutch-American astronomer Gerard Kuiper found carbon dioxide in the atmosphere in 1947. In 1966, American scientists Robert Layton and Bruce Murray reported on Mars, the results of a numerical thermal environment model that posed considerable doubt about the water ice hypothesis. Their calculations suggested that atmospheric carbon dioxide would freeze at the poles under Martian conditions, and their model carbon dioxide caps growth and shrinkage mimic the real caps observed behavior. The model expected relatively thin seasonal sheets, just a few meters deep near the poles, and thinning towards the equator. Although their observations were later confirmed by thermal and spectral measurements taken by the twin Mariner 6 and 7 spacecraft when they flew by Mars in 1969, early telescopic observers noticed instances of briefly obscuring Martian surface features. They detected both white and yellow obscurations properly represented as condensed gas and dust. Also, telescopic observers noticed periodic disappearances of all dark marks, usually around southern summer. Again the outcome of global dust storms was correctly interpreted. 
spacecraft observations indicated that hazes, clouds, and fogs usually cover the surface. In 1947, Dutch-American astronomer Gerard P. Kuiper discovered from telescopic observations that the Martian atmosphere consists primarily of carbon dioxide. The atmosphere is very small, exerting less than 1% of Earth's surface atmospheric pressure. Owing to the wide variations in Mars topography, surface pressures vary over a factor of 15. Just tiny quantities of water are found in today's atmosphere. If it all precipitated out it would form a 10 micrometer thick layer of ice, crystals that could be collected into a solid block of ice not much larger than a medium-sized terrestrial iceberg. Despite the small amount of water, the atmosphere is near saturation, and clouds of water ice are normal. Topographic depressions also observe low-lying clouds and fogs i.e., valleys, or craters. Thin clouds are common at the morning terminator, the dividing line between the lit and unlit portions of the planet's disk, and orographic clouds form around prominent topographic features such as craters and volcanoes when moist air is raised over elevated terrain and cooled. At mid-latitudes, westward-moving spiral-shaped storm systems, similar to those on Earth, are commonly seen. Most of these clouds especially the early observers' white clouds are composed of water ice. Mars dust storms are normal. They can occur at any time but are most common in southern spring and summer when Mars passes closest to the sun and surface temperatures at their peak. Many storms are regional and last a few weeks. However every second or third year, dust storms become national. At their height, dust is so high in the atmosphere that only the tops of the loftiest volcanoes up to 21 kilometers above the planet's mean radius are visible. While too small to be observed from Earth, Mars's orbit and the numerous landing sites of spacecraft have seen dust devils. Narrow tracks, thought by dust devils, are also visible in high-resolution orbit images. The characteristic temperature in the lower atmosphere is around 70 degrees Celsius, which is usually cooler than the normal daytime surface temperature of 20 degrees Celsius. These values are in the same range as those encountered in winter on Earth and Antarctica. Over a very dark surface in summer, daytime temperatures will peak at about 17 degrees Celsius. Temperature decreases with elevation above the turbulent layer near the surface. Around 1.5 degrees C-KM, 2.4 degrees C-Mile. From altitude. Unlike Earth's, Mars' atmosphere experiences broad seasonal pressure fluctuations when carbon dioxide, the main constituent, snows out at the winter pole and returns directly to a spring gas, sublimes. Since the southern winter cap is higher than the northern, while the southern cap is larger, air pressure reaches a minimum during the southern winter. The pressure varies by 26% annually when some 7.9 trillion metric tons of carbon dioxide exits the atmosphere seasonally. This is equal to an average thickness of at least 23 centimeters, solid carbon dioxide or several meters of carbon dioxide snow over the large region of seasonal polar caps. Carbon dioxide is 95.3% of the atmosphere by weight nine times the amount of Earth's far more vast atmosphere. However much of Earth's carbon dioxide is chemically trapped in sedimentary rocks, the volume in the Martian atmosphere is less than a thousandth of the sum. Martian atmosphere equilibrium is molecular nitrogen, water vapor, and noble gases. There are also trace quantities of gases formed from primary constituents by photochemical reactions, typically high in the atmosphere, including molecular oxygen, carbon monoxide, nitric oxide, and small amounts of ozone. The lower atmosphere provides gas to the planet's ionosphere, where densities are low, temperatures are high, and components separate through mass diffusion. Various constituents in the top of the atmosphere are lost to space, impacting the remaining gas isotopic composition. For example, as hydrogen is lost preferentially over its heavier deuterium isotope, Mars' atmosphere contains five times more deuterium than Earth's. While water is only a minor component of the Martian atmosphere, mainly due to low atmospheric and surface temperatures, it plays an important role in atmospheric chemistry and meteorology. The Martian atmosphere is effectively saturated with water vapor, but there is no liquid surface water. Planetary temperature and pressure are so low that water molecules can exist only as ice or vapor. Despite very cold night surface temperatures, little water is exchanged daily with the surface. 
Water vapor is mixed evenly up to altitudes of 10 to 15 kilometers and displays high seasonal latitudinal gradients. The Northern Hemisphere's Biggest Shifts During summer in the north, the carbon dioxide cap leaves behind a water ice cap. Sublimation of water from the residual cap results in a high ambient north-to-south concentration of water vapor. In the south, where a small carbon dioxide cap persists in the summer and only a small amount of water ice has been observed, there is usually no high water vapor gradient in the atmosphere. Atmospheric water vapor is thought to be in contact with a much larger Martian soil reservoir. Subsurface ice deposits seen widespread on Mars at 40 degrees poleward latitudes, very low subsurface temperatures will prevent ice from sublimating. The 2001 Mars Odyssey spacecraft confirmed that ice is present at latitudes above 60 degrees within a meter of the Earth, and the Phoenix lander found ice below the surface at 68 degrees north, although it is unclear how far the ice layer extends. Images taken by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter showed new impact craters at latitudes between 40 degrees north and 60 degrees north that exposed the groundwater ice to a depth of 74 centimeters. In comparison, ice is unstable at low latitudes and any ice present in the ground appears to sublime the atmosphere. Isotopic measurements indicate that in the past, greater quantities of carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and argon were present in the atmosphere and that Mars may have lost much of its inventory of volatile substances early in its existence, either in space or on the ground Mars once had a much thicker atmosphere that was largely lost to space by the solar wind and the ultraviolet radiation of the sun. Methane was found in Mars' atmosphere. The Curiosity rover detected a seasonal variation in methane, but measurements from orbiters showed only intermittent or even complete absence of methane. This contradiction indicates that before spreading through the atmosphere, some mechanism eliminates the methane observed near the surface. Volcanoes and meteorites have been removed as sources for methane, leaving as potential sources chemical reactions between rock and water or metabolism. The Martian atmosphere's vertical structure, that is the temperature-pressure-to-altitude relationship is partly determined by a complicated balance of many energy transport processes, and partly by how energy from the sun is carried into the atmosphere and lost by radiation into space. Two factors dominate the lower atmosphere's vertical structure its composition of virtually pure carbon dioxide and vast amounts of suspended dust. Since carbon dioxide efficiently radiates at Martian temperatures, the atmosphere can respond rapidly to changes in the amount of solar radiation received. The suspended dust absorbs substantial amounts of heat directly from sunlight and provides distributed energy in the lower atmosphere. Surface temperatures depend on latitude, fluctuating across a wide range tonight. At the Viking 1 and Pathfinder landing sites, both around 20 degrees north latitude, Temperatures at an approximately human height above the surface ranged regularly from a low of nearly 84 degrees Celsius just before sunrise to an early afternoon high of 33 degrees Celsius. This temperature swing is much greater than in Earth's desert regions. The difference is greatest near the ground and occurs because the thin, dry atmosphere causes the surface to radiate its heat rapidly throughout the night. This ability is hampered during dust storms, decreasing the temperature swing. Over a few kilometers, the daily variance is dampened, but other oscillations occur in the atmosphere as a result of direct solar energy supply. These temperature and pressure oscillations, also called tides because they are frequent, regular, and synchronized with the sun's location, give the Martian atmosphere a very complex vertical structure. Atmospheric cooling with altitude at a rate of about 40 kilometers, at which level, called tropopause, temperature becomes about 130 degrees Celsius stables. This rate, calculated by the Viking and later Pathfinder spacecraft as they descended through the atmosphere, was unusually low, scientists had predicted it would be nearly 5 kilometers. This rate is substantially lower than expected due to a large amount of suspended dust. Over 100 kilometers, the atmosphere structure is determined by the tendency of heavier molecules to concentrate below lighter ones. This diffusive separation mechanism overcomes turbulence's propensity to mix all constituents. At these high altitudes, the sun's ultraviolet light absorption dissociates and ionizes gases, contributing to complex sequences of chemical reactions. 
atmosphere top has an average temperature of around 27 degrees Celsius. The global pattern of atmospheric circulation on Mars shows many superficial parallels, but the root causes are very different. Among these variations is the ability of the atmosphere to respond rapidly to local conditions of solar heat input, the lack of oceans, which on Earth are highly resistant to temperature changes, the wide altitude range of the planet, the heavy internal heating of the atmosphere due to suspended dust, and the seasonal deposition and release of a substantial part of the Martian atmosphere. Near-surface winds at the Viking and Pathfinder landing sites were typically behavioral and generally moderate. Average speeds were usually below 2 meters per second, although gusts were reported up to 40 meters per second. Other findings, including streaks of wind-blown dust and patterns in dune fields and several cloud types, offered additional clues about surface winds. Global circulation models, which integrate all the factors known to affect atmospheric activity, predict a heavy wind dependency on Martian seasons due to the broad horizontal temperature gradients associated with the edge of the polar caps in the fall and winter. Powerful jet streams with speeds of 100 meters per second at high winter latitudes. Circulation is less drastic in spring and fall when light winds predominate. Unlike on Earth, Mars also has a relatively large north-south circulation that moves the atmosphere to and from the winter and summer poles. Occasionally, the general circulation pattern is erratic and experiences large-scale wave motions and instabilities, a frequent sequence of alternating high and low-pressure systems were observed in the Viking lander site's pressure and wind records. Smaller motions and oscillations, driven by both sun and surface topography, are widespread. For example, at the Viking and Pathfinder landing sites, winds change direction and speed during the day in response to the sun's location and local land slope. Turbulence is an important factor in increasing and sustaining the vast amount of dust in the Martian atmosphere. Dust storms tend to start at favored locations in the southern hemisphere during spring and summer. At first, an operation is local and vigorous for reasons not yet understood, and vast quantities of dust are thrown into the atmosphere. If the amount of dust exceeds a critical quantity, the storm intensifies quickly, and high winds bring dust to all areas of the Earth. In a few days, the storm darkened the entire surface and decreased visibility to less than 5% of average. The intensification process is short-lived, as atmospheric clarity begins to return almost immediately, becoming normal typically in a few weeks. Martian terrain character was well known from spacecraft photography and altimetry. Nearly the entire planet was photographed from orbit at 20-meter resolution and selected areas at resolutions as high as 20 centimeters. The laser altimeter on Mars Global Surveyor also measured surface elevations for the entire Earth, averaging 300 meters across to 1 meter vertical accuracy. Many maps were made to explain topography, geology, temperature, mineral distributions, and various other details. After Mariner 9, the prime meridian on Mars the equivalent of the Greenwich meridian on Earth was identified as passing through a small crater within the larger airy crater. Longitude was measured in degrees to the west of this meridian around the planet. Later, several scientists shared a preference for a longitude coordinate scheme that increases east of the prime meridian. Mars maps were published for one or both of these systems. Despite being thin, Mars has more relief than Earth. The planet's lowest point in the Hellas impact basin is 8 kilometers below the reference mark. The highest point at Olympus Mons Volcano Summit is 21 kilometers above the reference level. Thus the elevation range is 29 kilometers compared to around 20 kilometers on Earth i.e., from the bottom of the Mariana Trench to the top of Mount Everest. Since Mars has no oceans, a reference level had to be described in terms other than sea level. In the early 1970s, the comparison was the elevation at which ambient pressure is 6. L millibars, about 0.006 of Earth's sea level pressure. When Mars Global Surveyor acquired more accurate elevation data, a better reference was required and the mean radius of 3,389.51 km was selected. One of the Martian surface's most striking features is the contrast between the southern and northern hemispheres. Much of the southern hemisphere is high-standing, heavily cratered, resembling Moon's battered highlands. The most northern hemisphere is thin and sparsely cratered. 
The difference in mean elevation between the two hemispheres is about 6 kilometers. The topographic border between the hemispheres is not parallel to the equator, but approximately follows a broad circle that is about 30 degrees inclined. In some areas, the border is wide and irregular, elsewhere, there are cliffs. Some of Mars' most eroded areas occur around the frontier. Landforms include outflow channels, collapse areas called chaotic terrain, and an obscure combination of valleys and ridges called fretted terrain. Straddling the western border is the Tharsis Rise, a huge volcanic pile 4,000 kilometers across and 8 km above the center reference mark. It is 12 kilometers above the northern plains and 2 kilometers above the adjacent cratered southern highlands. On or near the Tharsis Rise are the planet's largest volcanoes seemingly missing in either hemisphere are the types of landforms resulting from plate tectonics on Earth for example, long linear mountain chains similar to the Andes, ocean trenches, or a global system of interconnected ridges. The western hemisphere is the Tharsis Rise, a massive volcanic pile 4,000 kilometers across and 8 km above the center reference mark. It is 12 kilometers above the northern plains and 2 kilometers above the adjacent cratered southern highlands. On or near the Tharsis Rise are the planet's largest volcanoes seemingly missing in either hemisphere are the types of landforms resulting from plate tectonics on Earth for example, long linear mountain chains similar to the Andes, ocean trenches, or a global system of interconnected ridges. The number of very large craters in southern highlands suggests a considerable surface age. Planetary scientists have found that the rate of major asteroid impacts on the Moon was very high after the Moon formed 4.5 billion years ago, and then decreased steadily between 3.8 billion and 3.5 billion years ago. Surfaces formed before decline are highly cratered, those formed after are less. Mars had a similar cratering past. Southern highlands almost definitely survive over 3.5 billion years ago. The southern terrain has many distinctive crater types huge impact basins, wide, partially filled craters with shallow, flat floors and eroded rims, smaller, fresh-looking bowl-shaped craters like those on the moon, rampant and pedestal craters. Hellas, Mars' largest impact basin, is 8 kilometers deep and 7,000 kilometers long, including the broad elevated ring around the depression. Many craters measuring tens to hundreds of kilometers across are extremely eroded, as opposed to much smaller craters built on the younger plains, which are barely eroded. In comparison, erosion rates were much higher on early Mars. It is one piece of evidence that the atmosphere on early Mars was very different from what it was for most subsequent planet history. Many Martian craters appear different from moons. Since the lobes of ejecta the material is thrown out of the crater and spreading around it are bordered by a low ridge or wall. The ejecta flowed over the ground, suggesting a muddy consistency. Some scientists conjectured that the mud was made from a mixture of debris and water under the surface. Around a pedestal crater, the ejected material forms a steep-sided base, or pedestal, with the crater in its border. The pedestal appears to have formed as wind carved away the surface layer of the surrounding area, while leaving the surrounding ejecta-covered portion intact. High-resolution Viking images revealed an additional feature of the ancient southern terrain the ubiquitous existence of small valley networks that mimic earth-water drainage systems. Examples include near Gal Vallis, north of the Argyre impact basin in the southern hemisphere, and Nandi Vallis, just north of the equator at the east end of Valles Marineris. Scientists have suggested two alternate mechanisms for their creation either surface rainfall runoff or groundwater outflow erosion that penetrated the surface. In either case, warm weather may have required their formation. A big surprise of the Mars Global Surveyor mission was discovering small fresh gullies on steep slopes at high altitudes. Strongly similar to water-worn gullies in Earth's desert regions. They were probably formed by melting ice from the poles and deposited at lower latitudes during times of high obliquity. Compared to the southern highlands, the smaller number of impact craters on the plains suggests that they formed between 3.8 and 3.5 billion years ago after decreasing impact rates. The plains can be divided into two wide areas, Tharsis Volcanic Plains, consisting largely of lava flows, and Northern Plains. Northern Plains have very little relief. They encompass all-terrain within 30 degrees of the pole except for layered terrain right around the pole. 
Three wide lobes reach lower latitudes. These include Christ Planitia and Acidalia Planitia, 30 degrees west longitude centered, Amazonas Planitia, 160 degrees west, and Utopia Planitia, 250 degrees west. The only substantial relief in this vast region is a large ancient impact basin called the Utopia Basin, 40 degrees north, 250 degrees west. The northern plains recognized many different forms of terrain. In Nabi terrain, flat plains divide various small hills. The hills seem to be remains of an ancient cratered surface now almost entirely buried in the plains by the younger material. Various plains have a polygonal fracture pattern that parallels landforms found in Earth's permafrost regions. Others have a strange thumbprint-like texture, probably suggestive of stagnant ice. The northern plains' origin remains controversial. Sections look like lava, like the lunar Maria. But some scientists have indicated that they were once populated by ocean-sized water bodies fed by massive floods, and that the plain's surface consists of sediments. Results from the Mars exploration rovers and spacecraft spectrometers indicate that the ancient highlands are compositionally distinct from the younger plains. The rover spirit landed on a plain type of plains. The rocks on the plains are mainly standard basalts with thin rinds rich in sulfur, chlorine, and other volatile elements. Rinds are possibly formed by basalts interacting with acid fogs. The rover then moved to Columbia Hills, where the rocks are very different. Mostly basalts and breccias impact, but many are pervasively altered and rich in sulfates and hydrated minerals. Soils composed of sulfates or silica are also present. Many of the rocks seem to have been permeated or weathered because of warm surface conditions. Overall, this combination of rocks and soils can be characteristic of highlands. Orbit findings tell a similar story. Globally, most plains are predominant, unaltered basaltic minerals such as olivine and pyroxene. Alteration minerals, such as clays, are widespread in the ancient cratered terrain. Results show that surface conditions changed drastically around 3.7 billion years ago. Before that time, warm and wet conditions were normal, resulting in extensive rock alterations. After that, such conditions were uncommon and rock alterations were minor. Most ancient cratered terrain is dissected by dry valley networks, often 1 to 2 kilometers across and up to 2,000 kilometers long. They mimic terrestrial river systems. The valleys are almost certainly formed by slow water erosion. Many local lowlands join a valley and exit a valley, suggesting that the lowland once held a lake. These areas are typically found in layered soils, likely deposited in lakes, and deltas are commonly seen where valleys join lowlands. Valley networks are uncommon but not absent in younger, sparsely cratered regions. The 1970s valley discovery was a surprise due to the impossibility of providing liquid surface water under present conditions. Their common presence in the heavily cratered terrain suggests that conditions on early Mars were much warmer and wealthier than they are today. Wide flood channels are observed incised into the Martian surface in many places. The channels are far wider than the valley networks usually tens of kilometers spanning hundreds of kilometers. Most emerge from rubble-filled depressions and proceed downhill into the southern plains of Hellas Basin. Much of the largest southwest drain to Christ Planitia. These are true channels in that they were once filled with flowing water as opposed to most river valleys, which have never been close to full but contain a much smaller river channel. The peak discharges of the floods that cut the larger outflow channels are estimated to have been a hundred to a thousand times the peak discharge of the Mississippi River truly enormous events. Some of the floods appear to have been formed by the catastrophic release of water from lakes. Others are formed by explosive eruptions of groundwater. The outflow channels are younger than the valley networks and probably mostly formed when conditions were similar to those that prevail today. A recent discovery of very young outflow channels suggests that they could form today by an eruption of groundwater from below the kilometer-thick permanently frozen ground. Close to the equator, centered on 70 degrees west longitude, are several enormous interconnected canyons collectively called Valles Marineris. Individual canyons are roughly 200 kilometers across. At the center of the system, Several canyons merge to form a depression 600 kilometers across and as much as 9 kilometers deep about five times the depth of the Grand Canyon. 
The entire system is more than 4,000 kilometers in length, or about 20% of Mars's circumference, almost the width of the United States. At several places within the canyons are thick, sulfate-rich sedimentary sequences, which suggest that lakes may have formerly occupied the canyons. Some of the lakes may have drained catastrophically to the east to form large outflow channels that start at the canyon's eastern end. In contrast to the Grand Canyon, which formed by erosion, the Valles Marineris formed mainly by faulting, although they have been enlarged by erosion. The canyons of Valles Marineris terminate to the west near, the crest of the Tharsis Rise, a vast bulge on the Martian surface more than 8,000 kilometers across and 8 kilometers high at its center. Near the top of the rise are three of the planet's largest volcanoes Ascrius Mons, Arcea Mons, and Pavonis Mons which tower 18, 17, and 14 kilometers respectively, above the mean radius. Just off the rise to the northwest are the planet's tallest volcano, Olympus Mons, 700 kilometers across and almost 22 kilometers above the surrounding plains. To the north is the largest volcano in an area extent, Alba Patera. It is 2,000 kilometers across, but only 7 kilometers in height. Between these giant landforms are several smaller volcanoes and lava plains. Tharsis itself is a vast pile of volcanic rock, and although it had largely formed by 3.7 billion years ago, it has been a center of volcanic activity ever since. The presence of the Tharsis rise has caused stresses within and deformation of the crust. A vast system of fractures radiating from Tharsis and compressional ridges arrayed around the rise is evidence of this process. The radial faulting around Tharsis appears to have contributed to the formation of the Valles Marineris system. Another volcanic rise is located in the northern region of Elysium at about 215 degrees west longitude. The Elysium rise is much smaller than Tharsis, being only 2,000 kilometers across and 6 kilometers high and is also the site of several volcanoes. At each pole is a stack of finely layered water ice-rich sediments about 3 kilometers thick and only a few tens of millions of years old. The layering is revealed around sediment periphery and in valleys that spiral out of poles. In winter, the sediments are coated with carbon dioxide ice but exposed in summer. They stretch south to 80 degrees latitude at the North Pole. Their extent is less well-defined at the South Pole but they seem to extend further from the pole than the north. The layering is assumed to result from differences in the ratio of dust and ice, possibly due to shifts in rotational axis tilt. Water ice is forced off the poles at high obliquities, allowing the remaining water ice caps to melt completely and the ice to deposit at lower latitudes. The highest water ice caps are at low obliquities. Obliquity differences also influence the occurrence of dust storms and pole deposition. The deposits are young since they've all accumulated after the last time of high obliquity when extracting the previous sediments. One peculiarity of the North Pole sediments is that they are surrounded by a large dune field rich in sulfate mineral gypsum and may be rest on it. Under present conditions, at altitudes greater than 40 degrees, ground ice is permanently stable at depths less than 1 meter below the surface as temperatures never reach the frost point. The ice is shallow enough for orbit detection above 60 degrees latitude. Ice was also located just below the Phoenix lander at 68 degrees north. The latest impact craters excavated the soil to depths of more than 2 meters, at latitudes above 40 degrees, exposing ground ice. There are also various surface features caused by abundant ground ice. These include polygonally broken soil similar to that found in terrestrial permafrost regions and general terrain softening, possibly caused by near-surface materials ice abetted flow. A striking feature of ice indicative 40-degree, 60-degree latitude bands is the appearance of debris aprons at the base of most steep slopes. Sloping materials seem to have flowed tens of kilometers from the slopes, and ground-penetrating radar indicates that the aprons contain significant fractions of ice. During times of high obliquity, ice formed glaciers from the poles accumulated on the surface at lower latitudes. Atmospheric circulation modeling indicates that the preferred ice deposition sites during these times are the western slopes of the Tharsis volcanoes and northeastern Hellas Basin. All these areas are rich features of inflow and moraine-like landforms, indicating that glaciers were still present in the past. 
The radar instrument on board the spacecraft Mars Express found a potential lake of liquid water under the south polar ice cap. Since the ground temperature below the polar cap is believed to be around 68 degrees C, the lake water should be extremely salty. The North Polar region also contains Mars' largest dune field. The dunes, which occupy the northern part of the plain known as Vastitas Borealis, form a band that almost encircles the North Polar cap. In some areas, an interlayer of sand and seasonal carbon dioxide snow can be seen, suggesting that the dunes are active at least on a seasonal time scale. Mars' interior is uncertain. Mars' moment of inertia suggests a central center with a radius of kilometer isotopic meteorite results determined to have originated from Mars indicate undeniably that the Earth differentiated separated into a metal-rich heart and rocky mantle at the end of the planetary accretion era 4.5 billion years ago. The world has no observable magnetic field to suggest today's core convection. Wide regions of magnetized rock were found in the oldest terrains however, which indicates that early Mars had a magnetic field, but vanished as the Earth cooled and the core solidified. Martian meteorites also suggest that the core could be more sulfur-rich than the core of Earth, and the mantle more iron-rich. Today, Mars is almost definitely active volcanically, but at very low levels. Some Martian meteorites, all volcanic rocks, display ages as young as a few hundred million years, and some of the planet's volcanic surfaces are so sparsely cratered that they may be tens of millions years old. Thus in the recent past, Mars was volcanically active, suggesting that its mantle is warm and melting locally. Mars' gravity field is somewhat different from Earth's. On Earth, excesses and mass deficits in the surface crust, corresponding to the presence of large mountains and deep oceans, tend to be compensated by compensating masses at depth. Hence the pull of gravity on Earth is the same on high mountains as over the ocean. This also refers to Mars' oldest terrain, such as the Hellas Basin and the Southern Highlands. The younger terrains, including the Tharsis and Elysium domes, are only slightly compensated. These two regions are correlated with high gravity that is, areas where the measured gravity is substantially higher than elsewhere due to the wide dome mass. Similar regions, mascons, were found and mapped on Earth's moon. Since the gravity over the southern highlands is around the same as over the low-lying northern plains, the southern highlands must be underlined by a thicker material layer that is less dense than the mantle below. Estimates of the thickness of the Martian crust vary from just 3 kilometers below the Isidus impact basin just north of the equator and east of Sirtis Major to over 90 kilometers south of the Tharsis Rise. Scientists have identified over 30 Mars-borne meteorites. Their initial doubts were first posed when meteorites that seem to be volcanic rocks were found to be around 1.3 billion years old instead of all other meteorites 4.5 billion years. These rocks had to come from a body geologically active in the relatively recent past, and Mars was the most likely candidate. The rocks also have identical oxygen isotopic ratios, noticeably different from Earth rocks, Moon rocks, and other meteorites. Finally, a Martian origin was proven when it was found that some of them contained trapped gases of the same composition as the Martian atmosphere as measured by the Viking landers. Big impacts are believed to have expelled rocks from the Martian surface. They then reached solar orbit several million years before crashing on Earth. Claims in the mid-1990s of discovering proof of past microscopic existence in one of the meteorites, ALH 84001, were regarded skeptically by the general scientific community. Nothing was discovered about Mars' two moons, Phobos and Deimos, following their discovery in 1877 before they were observed by orbiting spacecraft a century later. Viking 1 flew 100 kilometers from Phobos and Viking 2 to 30 kilometers from Deimos. Phobos orbits 39 minutes every 7 hours around Mars. It travels about 6,000 kilometers from the surface in an unusually close orbit less than twice the radius of the planet. It's so close that without internal power, it will be ripped apart by gravitational forces. These forces also delay Phobos movement and could eventually cause the satellite to collide with Mars in less than 100 million years. Deimos has the same destiny. It travels in a distant orbit, allowing tidal forces to recede from the Earth. Phobos and Deimos are not visible anywhere on the planet due to their small scale, 
proximity to Mars and near equatorial orbits. Both moons are rock chunks, approximately ellipsoidal. Phobos is the two bigger. Phobos rough terrain is littered with impact craters. The biggest, the Stickney Crater, is about half the satellite's height. Its surface often exhibits a widespread system of linear fractures or grooves, many of which are geometrically Stickney related. In comparison, Deimos' surface appears smooth, as its many craters are almost entirely buried by fine rubble, and it displays no fracture mechanism. The disparity in appearance between the two moons is thought to be due to the final disposition of the impact-producing debris. In the case of the inner, more massive Phobos, either the ejected material dropped back to the surface or, leaving the satellite with enough momentum to go into orbit, later fell on Mars. For the more distant, smaller Deimos, the satellite remained in orbit until it was retrieved, sifting down to blanket its surface. The albedo or reflectivity of both moon surfaces is very low, comparable to the most primitive meteorite forms. One hypothesis of moon's origin is that they are asteroids captured when Mars formed. Since the beginning of the space age, Mars has been a priority of planetary exploration for three key reasons. One, it is the world's most Earth-like. Two, other than Earth, it is the planet most likely to have developed indigenous life. And three, it is likely to be the first extraterrestrial planet to be visited by humans. Between 1960 and 1980, Mars exploration was a major aim of both U.S. and Soviet space programs. The U.S. spacecraft successfully flew through Mars, Mariners 4, 6, and 7, orbited the planet, Mariner 9, and Vikings 1 and 2, and placed lander modules on its surface, Vikings 1 and 2. Three Soviet probes, March 2, 3, and 5, have explored Mars, two touching its surface. Mars 3 was the first spacecraft on the Earth to soft land an instrumented capsule on December 2, 1971, landing during a global dust storm, returning data for about 20 seconds. Mariner 9, the first spacecraft to orbit another planet, was in November 1971 around Mars and operated until October 1972. It returned a variety of spectroscopic, radio, and photographic results. Some 7,330 pictures covering 80% of the Earth revealed the history of widespread volcanism, ancient water erosion, and the reshaping of extensive surface areas by internal forces. Viking missions Corthene was the quest for extraterrestrial life. No unambiguous proof of biological activity was found, see below issue of life on Mars, but extensive knowledge about Martian geology, meteorology, and the physics and chemistry of the upper atmosphere was given on the two orbiters and two landers. Vikings 1 and 2 were orbited in June and August 1976, respectively. Lander modules descended from orbiters to the surface after discovering suitable locations. On July 20, 1976, Viking 1 landed in the Kreisplanitia area, and on September 3, 1976, Viking 2 landed 6,500 kilometers in Utopia Planitia. In 1988, Soviet scientists launched a pair of spacecraft, Phobos 1 and 2, to orbit Mars and slowfly observations of their two satellites. Phobos 1 failed during the year-long mission, but Phobos 2 reached Mars in early 1989, returning several days of observations from both the planet and Phobos before dysfunction. Amid the failures of several U.S. spacecraft missions to Mars in the 1990s, on July 4, 1997, Mars Pathfinder successfully set up a robotic wheeled rover named Sojourner on the surface. This was followed by Mars Global Surveyor, who reached Mars in September 1997 and systematically mapped the planet from orbit for several years starting in March 1999. This included gravity and magnetic fields of Mars, surface topography, and surface mineralogy. The spacecraft also carried cameras for wide-angle and informative surface images at resolutions of up to 1.5 meters. Mars Odyssey safely reached Mars orbit in October 2001 and began mapping other properties, including surface chemical composition, near-surface ice distribution, and near-surface material physical properties. Neutron measurements indicated that the polar regions above latitude 60 degrees have large water ice reserves. Mars Odyssey also discovered caves on a volcano by using its infrared cameras to demonstrate that the temperatures of the cave entrances, which appeared as dark circular characteristics, did not change as much as the surrounding area. 
A spacecraft wave converged in late 2003 and early 2004 with mixed effects. Nozomi, launched on a leisurely trajectory by Japan in 1998, was the first to reach the planet's vicinity, but malfunctions prevented it from being placed into Mars orbit. Mars Express, the European Space Agency, launched in mid-2003 on a half-year journey to the Red Planet. Carrying instruments to research the atmosphere, surface, and underground, it entered Mars orbit on December 25, however, its British lander, Beagle 2, which was to explore rocks and soil for signs of past or present existence, did not develop radio contact after landing on the Martian surface the same day. Within weeks of its arrival, the Mars Express orbiter observed massive water ice fields as well as carbon dioxide ice at the southern pole and reported that the southern residual cap, like the northern one, contained permanently frozen water. It also found large sulfur-rich deposits, mostly in Valles Marineris, and clay minerals in heavily cratered lands. The US also released mid-2003. Mars Exploration Rover mission containing twin robotic landers, Spirit and Opportunity. Spirit hit Gusev Crater on January 3, 2004. Three weeks later, on January 24, Chance arrived across the world in Meridiani Planum. The six-wheeled rovers, each fitted with cameras and a suite of instruments that included a microscopic imager and a rock grinding tool, studied the rocks, soil, and dust around their landing sites that had been selected because they seemed to have been influenced by water in the past of Mars. Both rovers found past waterproof. Perhaps the most dramatic was Opportunity's discovery of rocks that seemed to be positioned on the shoreline of an ancient body of salty water. Each rover was planned for a 90-day nominal mission, but operated well beyond that time. Spirit and Opportunity stopped broadcasting in March 2010 and June 2018 respectively. Opportunity traveled 45 kilometers over 14 years, records of distance driven in project time on another world. In 2005, the US launched the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, carrying a 20-centimeter spectrometer resolution imaging system to determine the surface structure and ground-penetrating radar. The imaging system took photos of dark lines that seemed to be salty water flowing downhill after the Martian spring had melted. The spectrometer showed that clay minerals and other alterations suggesting a warm distant past are normal in ancient cratered terrains, while the radar determined the thickness of the ice on the poles and glaciers elsewhere. In 2008, U.S. probe Phoenix landed in Mars' north polar area. Phoenix carried a small chemical lab to analyze Arctic soil. It found water ice under Mars and alkaline soil. In 2012, the U.S. Mars Research Laboratory rover Curiosity landed in Gale Crater. Weighing about 900 kilograms, 2,000 pounds, and about 3 meters long, it was Mars' heaviest and longest rover. Gale Crater is tiny, so if Mars ever had surface water, it would have accumulated there. Eolis Mons, the central mountain of the crater, consists of several layers of sedimentary rock laid over most of Mars' geological past. Curiosity took pictures of water-transported gravel, indicating that at one time Gale Crater was possibly an ancient stream floor. Curiosity also found early Mars could sustain life. It discovered traces of organic molecules in 3.5 billion years old rock layers, and the amount of methane in the Martian atmosphere varies with the seasons. Two probes reached Martian orbit in September 2014. The U.S. Mars Atmosphere and Volatile Evolution probe analyzed the upper atmosphere and found that Mars lost much of its early atmosphere to ultraviolet radiation and solar wind from the Sunday India's Mars Orbiter mission. MOM probe was the first to hit another planet. Its instruments included a color camera, ultraviolet spectrometer, and methane sensor. The ExoMars mission was a joint European Space Agency slash Russia project. In October 2016, the first portion of the mission arrived at Mars and consisted of two spacecraft Trace Gas Orbiter and Schiaparelli Lander. Schiaparelli ejected early and crashed into the surface. TGO mapped the vertical distribution of atmospheric dust and water vapor. It detected no methane that clashes with Curiosity's detection and indicates that certain processes kill methane before it spreads in the atmosphere. In November 2018, the U.S. InSight, Interior Exploration Using Seismic Investigations, Geodesy, and Heat Transport, Lander hit Elysium Planitia. 
InSight put a seismometer on the surface that allowed Mars' first quake's detection. The lander also deployed a probe burrowing into the ground to analyze soil heat flow. However, the probe seemed to encounter some underground barrier, like a rock or gravel, as it stopped before reaching the target depth. InSight also carried two CubeSats, small satellites whose basic unit is a modular cube measuring approximately 10 centimeters for inches, square per side. Each InSight CubeSats, Mars Cube 1, Marco, consisted of six such units. The first CubeSats launched to another planet relayed messages to Earth from InSight during their landing. Future missions to Mars in 2021 include the second component of the ExoMars mission, the Rosalind Franklin rover. Rosalind Franklin can hold a drill up to 2 meters underground to collect onboard soil samples for examination. The American Mars 2020 rover will also hold a drill to gather core samples that could be taken to Earth for study. HX-1 will consist of an orbiter and a small rover. The UAE Orbiter Hope will hold a camera and infrared and ultraviolet spectrometers to research the Martian atmosphere. From the beginning of Mars telescopic observations, people have wondered whether life might have begun on the planet and what life could be like. Early observers were primarily concerned with intelligent life, but the emphasis now is on the origin of life, microbial communities, and their survival limits. Views of Mars life chances have ranged greatly in recent decades. In the 1960s, the suggestion that changes observed at the telescope may have a biological cause led to Mariner 9's 1972 attempts to track surface changes and the 1975 launch of Viking landers to Mars. The spacecraft had several sophisticated experiments to detect metabolism and organic molecules. Negative findings from these studies resulted in substantial pessimism that persisted for life chances through the 1980s. However, several factors led to a more positive view. The first is the realization that life can exist in much broader conditions than previously thought possible, including near deep sea vents at temperatures well above 1000 degrees Celsius in basalt rocks far below the surface, and in very saline and acid environments. The second is the discovery that life on Earth began very quickly, probably before the end of heavy bombardment, which may mean that life's origin is not an incredibly low probability occurrence, but may follow if the right conditions are present. The third is mounting evidence that Earth-like conditions on early Mars before life originated on Earth. A fourth element is understanding of Earth and Mars exchanging materials. More than 30 fragments of Mars were found on Earth, despite difficulties in separating Mars rocks from Earth rocks. Bringing Earth rocks to Mars is harder. However, during the heavy bombardment era, when life may have already begun on Earth and conditions on Mars were Earth-like, fragments of Earth may have been transported to Mars. Thus, life may have originated independently on Mars or from Earth. In 1996, a group of scientists announced that they had discovered evidence of life in a Martian meteorite. They mentioned, 1, bacteria-like objects in electron microscope imaging, 2, hydrocarbon detection, 3, mineral assemblies not formed in chemical equilibrium, and 4, magnetic particles similar to those produced by some terrestrial bacteria. The announcement sparked a lively scientific discussion on argument validity. The scientific consensus now is that all findings have reasonable abiological explanations, and the arguments are possibly invalid. Despite this setback, the Mars exploration program's key driver is still life search. Since liquid water is so important to live, the initial emphasis was on finding evidence of warm conditions that would allow liquid water to survive. Evidence for such conditions at least on early Mars is now convincing, and there is some evidence that in some areas liquid water also flows on the surface. Exploration thrust is likely to change to find more clear evidence, such as organic remains and isotopic signatures. It could be argued that the best approach is to search for early fossil remains in the past of Mars when conditions were more Earth-like. However the Martian meteorite controversy and disagreements about early earthly existence point to the difficulties of discovering convincing proof of microbial fossil life. Alternatively, it might be argued that the best approach is to search for present-day life in niches, such as warm volcanic regions or the occasional flows of briny water, in the expectation that life, if it ever began on Mars, will thrive in hospitable conditions. 
Despite hope, human exploration remained decades away, since the Apollo program ended in the early 1970s that Mars exploration would soon follow. The technological difficulties of getting people back to Mars, although demanding, are not daunting. The main challenge was a convincing argument to explain the enormous costs and risks. Advocates argued that exploring Mars and expanding human scope into Earth-Moon space need no realistic reasoning, exploring is an integral part of being human. Others argued that practical benefits like the economic stimulus, scientific discovery, and input on technology will result. Despite numerous strong supporters, human exploration of Mars now seems further from fact than in the 1970s.